to wow them with your presentation. From John Newenberg's presentation today, you're going to learn the five rules and why it matters to creating amazing presentations. It doesn't matter if you're trying to champion your ideas at a school or in a Fortune 100 company, you're probably going to, at some point, be involved with using PowerPoint or Keynote, or here's a new one for me, Prezi. Prezi, online. I'll be online. learning something today, too. So communication itself is about getting others to adopt your point of view to help them to understand why you're excited or sad or optimistic, essentially whatever feeling you're trying to invoke upon your audience. John will teach us how to raise your visibility with powerful presentations that engage your audience at all levels. And to let you know why John is standing here today, John Neuenberg is an award-winning business coach who has worked with hundreds of clients. There are almost as many different ways of delivering business coaching as there are business coaches. And John coaches in three primary areas. Transactional, which is getting things done using proven tools, strategies, and techniques. Transformational, working with you to make the shifts in mindset needed to facilitate your success. And accountability, helping you to stay accountable for the results you have chosen that up until now may have been just a dream. In an earlier life, John was the managing director of the BC Liquor Store that now does $2.8 billion in revenue with a net income of $911 million. Before that, he was an executive with a national menswear retailer. And when not coaching, John hangs out with his fiancée, Jennifer. John enjoys golf, skiing, running, and reading. So please join me in welcoming John Newenberg. Thanks everybody, thanks for uh, coming. So hey, we're gonna do networking and we uh, took the uh, spin or twist on it that we're gonna talk about visibility in our three sessions today. My name's John Neuenberg and I'm gonna focus on presentations. Okay, that's what, if, you're, if that's what you're here for, you're in the right room. Doesn't matter whether you're gonna make a presentation at a Fortune 500 company, your BNI six or 10 minute talk, what you're really wanting to do is to get your audience to understand why you're excited, sad, optimistic, or whatever it is you're feeling because you want them to accept those feelings. You want them, you want to make the sale. Is that, is that about right? So what we want to do today is learn how to make powerful presentations that impact your audience because after all, the only reason you want to make a speech is to, does anybody doubt that Frank wants to change the world? Everybody agree that he's an awesome speaker? and that he believes in this motto that we're here to change the world. Is that about right? So that's what I want to do today. I want to change the world. <laughs> Ever seen a lousy presentation? Yes. Yes. Rhetorical question, <laughs> dumb question. So now's the time for a, come on, this is a revival. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. The audience participation part. But first let me just take, uh, if you want a copy of the presentation, Go to this website, you can take a photo of this. Uh, Justin in the back of the room is recording not just this presentation, but all three of ours. Uh, all three of us in our respective sites are gonna have uh, the presentation available, so it's easy. you don't have to worry about making notes and that kind of thing. And uh, I'm gonna ask you for your email address, so that's the only price you gotta pay if you wanna get a copy of the presentation, okay? So is that a fair deal? Yeah. Okay, awesome. Uh, Laura just did an awesome um, introduction to me, so I'm going to skip through this part real quick because it basically just says all of that. Again, there's lots more information, and a lot of people on LinkedIn have given me endorsements, which I'm grateful for. And so here's a little bit of social proof that uh, others, apart from Laura and me, think that I'm okay as well. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> there's lots of testimonials on my website if you want to have a look at that. So let's have a presentation makeover. That's why we came here. 95% of presentation sucks. Who agrees with that? <laughs> you know what? I'm exaggerating. I'm sorry. I'm exaggerating just a little. Yeah, it's about 99%. Who would agree with that? Yeah, that's right. So why? Because presentations are boring. They're mostly bullet points. Can you see the difference? Anybody remember a Bill Gates presentation? Everybody, anybody seen a Bill Gates presentation? How many people have seen a Steve Jobs presentation? How many people went to YouTube to look for the thing? Why is that? It's because PowerPoint was invented by the engineers on one side of that screen to talk to the creative and the marketing people on the other side of the screen, and the two have never figured out how to make the thing work. See what I'm saying? 
So today, I really am going to make the world a better place. That's my goal for us here today. We're going to make the world a better place. And this guy is John Medina. He wrote an awesome book, and it's called Brain Rules. Pick it up. I'm going to offer you an example of it. And we're not going to do all 12 of the rules. We're only going to do two of the rules. And so brain rule number four is we don't pay attention to boring things. OK, I know. You got up at 4, 5.30 in the morning this morning, and I got, came to hear this. <laughs> We don't pay attention to boring things. Well, let me explain how this happened. 200,000 years ago is about when we evolved from apes and became more or less modernly correct about 200,000 years ago, behaviorally about 50,000 years ago, and we invented writing about 6,000 years ago, so 4,000 BC. So why this matters is most of the, our lives, most of mankind's time, all we ever worried about is, is that saber-toothed tiger going to kill me? Or that person or thing looks attractive, can I mate with it? And so our brain is hardwired for 194,000 years to think that way. So we don't pay attention to boring things. So unless you're a saber tooth tire doing a presentation, I'm not going to pay attention. So how do we get around that? Why do some ideas stick and others don't? It's stories. Stories is the answer. Because facts tell, stories sell. Now let me just unpack that for a minute. We know about stories even when we're kids. The third word, apparently, we learn after mom and dad is? No. Story. How many of you? <laughs> you. This man's from New York. Story. So um, how, many kids, uh, how many people have kids that are like five, six years old? How many times have they seen Dora the Explorer? Uh, Hundreds. Hundreds, right? How does that happen? How can they do that? Look at these kids. How old are those kids? Maybe a year, would you agree? About a year old? Um, can they walk or talk? Not very well, but can they express emotion? Can they tell their story? Pretty much, huh? I don't know what that one on the left is thinking, but it's pretty clear that it's upset, or he's upset. You know, indigenous peoples throughout the world, these ones are aboriginals in Australia, uh, but on the west coast, uh, here on the west coast, in Africa, everywhere around the world, throughout mankind, 200,000 years, they've been communicating through, and their histories are told through, yeah, through their art and through their stories, right? So why does that matter? It's because facts reside in the left side of our brain, the logic side, this is not for loser, logic, logic side of the brain, the little monotony. So facts reside in the left side of our brain, and the right side of our brain is where all the emotions hang out. So if you want your facts to stick, you've got to attach them to an emotion, and the best way to do that is with a story. You're getting with it. We're getting it. Yeah, so that's why stories matter so much, because they hook us to the memories. They hook us to the memories. And so if you want to be memorable, you have to tell stories. So stories have five beats. Uh, think about a typical movie story. There's something that sets up the, 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 the movie. Something happens, the incident, the premise of the movie takes place. We start rising in action. We can feel the music rise. We can feel our skin tingle. You know, the crescendo is starting to happen. Then, oh my god, something changed. And we move in a new direction. And that all comes together with a resolution, or the end of the story, and the happily ever after. And in business, what we want to do is the thing called the CTA, and Allison knows what that is? Call your call to action. What do you want people to do as a result of your presentation, as a result of your demonstration? You want them to take some action. So you can do this whether that's five minutes or 45 minutes. You can tell the same story in five or 45, depending on how much time you've got. So here's a guy, and all he was asked to do is give the commencement address at the 2005 Stanford University. We're talking major, major university. And here's how he starts. Today, I'm going to tell you three stories from my life. No big deal, just three stories. Wow. The first is about connecting the dots. The second is about love and loss. And the third is about death. This is one he famously ended by saying, stay hungry, stay foolish. And he's only had 16 million views. Do you think he knows about stories? Do you, do you think he understands why? How about this guy? We celebrate the birth of Jesus on Christmas Day. The wisdom is old. The Koran is old. The Bible is old. It's the greatest story ever told. He's only got 12 Grammys and 100 million in album sales, so he knows something about the power of stories as well. 
It's the uh, lyrics of a song called Old, and it's on this album called You're the One. It's awesome. So there's a 10 minute rule when you're doing a presentation. After about 10 minutes, people get bored. Right? Does everybody relate to that? So every 10 minutes, the brain needs a break. Frank did two exercises today, exactly on cue, about 10 minutes. Everybody get up out of the chair, stomp, yeah, nod, what? Right? Awesome, awesome job. So every 10 minutes, you got to get people excited, re-energized, reconnected somehow, you know, out of their chair, so to speak. And so today, this is what I want to do. I want to have you pay attention to this. Let me see if I can get it to work. I may have to call my director here. Click. This is taking more time. This is an awareness test. Please pay attention. How many passes does the team in white make? Perfect. Is 13. But did you see the moonwalking bear? cyclists, which isn't really my point here. <laughs> I am trying to get this thing to move forward, so excuse me for a second, because multitasking is a myth. We do not multitask. You're kidding yourself if you believe that. What we do is called switch tasking. Our brain can only do one thing at a time. And so when you think you're multitasking, you're really doing two things quickly, back to back to back to back. Multitasking is a myth. Uh, Tony Robbins says that if you, that we're best when we allocate our time to, to two hour chunks. And if we take an interruption, we lose about 20 minutes of productivity. So every time you take an interruption, take a phone call, go to Facebook, um, respond to an email, and you do that three times in two hours, how much productivity have you lost? An hour, that's exactly right. So put the thing away. We do not multitask. I can prove this to you in other ways, but there's an example. You, could, you did not see the bear because you were paying attention to the thing you were asked to do. Which one? <laughs> the book was written by a man. You know what, Janice? Just for that, I'll prove it to you later. <laughs> so when you're getting ready to do your big talk, put away all the distractions and spit, allocate about a third of the time it's going to take for you to get ready to doing nothing but, but thinking, sketching, scripting what you're going to say. Before you pull out the laptop, before you pick up Prezi or Keynote, all you want to do is what's my story? Thank you very much. What do I want my audience to understand? And then you start building your slides. And this woman who wrote an awesome book called Slideology says that 30 slides can take 90 hours. And my presentation today has about 150 slides in 20 minutes. So you can imagine how much effort that takes. And then the last third of your effort is delivery, rehearsing. How am I going to get my audience to appreciate that? So when you start, don't start with the laptop. Start with the whiteboard, some paper, post-it notes are awesome. And you start with the last slide. What do you want the last slide to look like? Because that's what I want my audience to do as a result of my, that's how I'm going to change the world. They're going to do the last slide. And then you work backwards from there. We're hardwired to notice patterns. It's another one of the brain rules. We notice patterns as humans, because after all, after 194,000 years, it was good to know the last time I saw sand like that, it was quicksand. Best not to go into that. We recognize patterns. Today, we do jigsaw puzzles, crossword puzzles. We love patterns, right? So here's an example I want to prove it to you. It looks like a random bunch of letters, doesn't it? Until I do some graphic design and show you a pattern. Now, I know some of you are wondering what WTF stands for. I know it's the Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. But after the lockout that the NHL has put us through, it might stand for something else. <laughs> so here's an annoying example of what happens when you use a bunch of different types, fonts, a bunch of different colors, a bunch of different sizes. It's a jumbled mess. 
we notice patterns. That's what they see when you're doing your presentation. It's subconscious, but you're irritating your audience. So patterns matter. They're not called graphic decorators. They're called graphic designers. And so when you're putting together your pr presentation, you want to design. And so work up themes around your font types, colors, and sizes. No more than two or three of each. And, and a regular pattern. These are the, that's the font size for my headlines, my subs, my third points. So this is kind of boring. It's a good photo, but it's just in the middle of the page. Not really that interesting. So uh, composer, or, um, Photographers and other designers have a thing called the rule of thirds. And this is a different rule of thirds that the best way to compose is to put the central point of your image on the crosshairs because that's how you create tension. And so a symmetry is much more interesting, isn't it? You see how perfectly this was composed? Do you see where arm, arm, armpit is? Do you see what the bottom third is? How about this one? This is a shot that Apple used on their website when Steve Jobs died. It's not an accident that it perfectly aligns with the rule of thirds. How about this one? Vancouver's beautiful. It's even more beautiful when it's shot this way. Down here is the hill, which creates a false horizon. The middle third is, of course, our skyline, and the back third, the mountains, and so the eye is uh, carefully guided through the photo. Beautiful, beautiful shot. We have not just the water line, but we have the cloud line in the lower third, which gives us the feeling of this awesome huge sky. And 2013 is going to be fantastic because there's so much opportunity. So you know that image creates that feeling? So okay, brain rule number 10. Brain rule number 10 is vision trumps all other senses because vision takes about half the brain's power. So Frank this morning talked about we have five senses. That's absolutely true. Vision is the most important. When we communicate, just 7% of our uh, communication is through text. 38% is through tone of voice. Visual is about 55%. And Janice doesn't know I'm going to do this, but I'm going to prove this to you. Janice, excuse me for a minute. <laughs> now, what did I say? I love you. Now, those words are pretty endearing, aren't they? What did my tone of voice sound like? Awful. What about my body language? Awful. Didn't matter what I said. We completely rejected the words, but we quite accepted that the visual I got was what was really going on. See what I'm saying? So, vision counts for more than anything. So if you have an audience and you use just the word, 72% of the sorry, 72 hours later, 10% of the audience will remember. Use an image, 65% of that same audience will remember the image. So let's see some presentation makeovers. We've got the one in the upper left. It's kind of the before. We've got some funky script, funky bullets, a bunch of blah, blah. Doesn't really mean anything. And then on the bottom right, we've got his image and one of the things, most iconic statements that he's known for. Here's an example of in the upper left, we got a bunch of different, we got two different font sizes in the title alone. We got three, two images that don't relate. We got footnotes. The, the text runs into the image. It's a mess. And yet the bottom on the right, it's quite clear that one of the most important statements, a real uh, statement of the times that Kennedy did in his inaugural speech, that's not what you country can do for you. Beautiful. Again, in the upper left, we have a, I don't know what that's supposed to, we got an image, we got a bar, we got data, none of that makes sense. The one on the right, oh, we're supposed to understand 5,000 bikes, which is about 10, 10 times more than the first year. That's a pretty good result. Might as well just leave the only slide everyone was looking at. <laughs> okay, prove it. Who can remember? It was pretty boring. Images convey way more than text does. So you've got to make numbers meaningful, another, another thing to remember. So Steve Jobs, 2001, is introducing the iPod. Could have said it was five gigabytes. The uh, comparison at the time was a Walkman's huge. It carries a cassette. But instead what he did is he said, it's 1,000 songs. And not only that, it fits in your pocket. Oh, I want one of those. 
thousand songs in my pocket. <gasps> so here's an example: the world's population. It's a pretty clean graph, right? It's not too complicated. It's kind of you know, the script's pretty good, but it's kind of hard to figure. What 2009? What's the population? Oh, that one's better. Population's going to be 6.7. 40 years later, it's about 50% bigger. I know that because the image is about 50% bigger. The world's ice, do you know that 90% of the world's ice is in Antarctica? How about now? Way more impactful. Can you feel how cold it is there? You see how the size of the script really does help us? 90%. So this is Seth Godin. He's going to offer us five rules for amazing presentations. Rule number one is no slide ought to have more than six words. You never need a slide ever more than six words. The only exception is quotes. And never less than 30 point font. Here's an example. This is a real slide, real slide that was presented to the military chiefs of staff of the US military. And they were trying to figure out what that meant. It has to do with the Afghanistan war. And this general said, when we figure out that slide, we'll figure out the war. The slide's more complicated than the war. So that's 30 point at the top. That's 12 point at the bottom. Can you see what the problem is? If you don't like this rule, here's the other rule. Uh, take the eldest person's age in the room. I'm going to guess there's someone at least who's 60. Divide by 2. That's your smallest font size. If you want it to read. Got it? 30. So no cheesy images or sound effects. Who has an office photo that looks like that one? Anybody? Does it look real? No? So if you're going to use an image, you might as well make, make it look realistic. Except this guy he, from South Park, he can have all the cheesy poops he wants. So no dissolved spins or crazy transitions. <laughs> ah! Doesn't it drive you crazy? What is that going to do to help me tell my story? I'm going to do a dissolve. See what I'm saying? <laughs> so uh, more images than text, much less text. So I could tell you the story of a Gulf oil spill, and it's pretty impactful. Background, I got volume, I got efforts, I got consequences. I'm going to tell the whole story, but I could do this. Uh, there were some consequences. Surf's up, who wants to go swimming? This guy did. He's a reporter, he's looking for the story. I hope he's wearing scuba gear, because if not, when he gets, comes up to breathe, he's gonna get a mouthful of direct. Three images, you can talk for a few minutes, way more impactful, everyone feels in the gut right now. That was horrendous for the environment there. So no handouts. Uh, that's what 22 words looks like. We can write in about 22 words. That's 105 words. That's how fast we speak, unless you're Frank and me at the moment. We can hear or listen at about 155. Isn't that amazing? We can hear faster than you can speak. And that's how fast we can read. So guess what? If you give out a handout, guess what's happening? They're winning. They're reading. Why are you here? So no handouts. You want to do a handout. What you do is you have three different view versions of your presentation. So version one on the left is what your audience sees. Version two is what's on here. That's where my speaker's notes are. And version three is a version of the, of the talk that someone could look at and read and understand. And if they could take your slides, leave your presentation, give it to someone else, and they know what it meant, you did it wrong. So here's the world's thinnest notebook, and here's how a mediocre presenter would show it. We got four different boxes, four different uh, title text sizes. MacBook Air is not even the major title, which is supposed to be the announcement. Someone got fancy and got an icon for the battery. Who the hell cares that it's got 12 by 1280 by 800 native, whatever that. Does anybody know what that means? Or uh, that it weighs three pounds? Let's see how the master does it. What is in that envelope? Oh my god, it must be precious. It's levitating off the stage. I want one of those. It's pretty exciting. 
So the engineers give you a bunch of data, the marketers give you an experience. They make you want to have it, they make you want to feel it, and that's what images, that's what a good presentation should do. So isn't it time for a presentation makeover? How about for you guys, for everyone here in the room? Can I have a hallelujah? Hallelujah! Awesome, thank you. So I got some questions, we're not going to take questions, but one of the ones that I know you're probably wondering about is what were your five beats? We we're going to have a presentation makeover, we're going to make the world a better place, we're going to do just two of the 12 rules, we're going to have five rules for better presentations, and I'm going to ask you to do better presentations yourself. That's the fifth beat of our story. These are the four guys and four books that I use to go through this. This is an awesome book. I can give you a five page professionally done summary if you take one of my cards, which is on the back of the front here, or you can send me a note. If you've got my email address, I'll send this to you. You'll be encouraged to go get the book itself. I'd love to sit down with you and see if you guys qualify for a complimentary uh, coaching session and not just on presentations. I'm happy to do it, but uh, I'm a business coach. I work on all, all things to do with small business. So thank you very much.